Andrew is going to tell us about what he wished he had known <laughs> earlier about the philosophy of science. Okay, I, um, you must be all getting quite tired, so I should be quite brief, and I, I hope uh, reasonably provocative. Um, my topic uh, links to Anthony's third question um, of uh, the, the three about this uh, the Circle Symposium. His third question is, how should we be training focuses, how should we be training researchers to focus on problems and to use these methodologies and so on? And um, I want to address the question of um, a component that I think should be part of any doctoral program, doctoral school, which is um, philosophy of science. Um, this relates to what we were saying about transferable skills, about uh, one idea of a doctorate being that it should provide some kind of basic intellectual training, which uh, not only hopefully leads to some personal fulfilment, but also maybe it could help the individual concern to contribute to society in some way or other. And I'll begin with something very personal, because um, my interest in the philosophy of science goes back to my own feelings of total inferiority um, in this area, where I, when I started my own doctorate back in the 1980s. Um, when I started my project then, I already knew a lot about my subject. In fact, I had the argument of my doctorate more or less in my head in some form um, at that point, because I started quite late. I had already been teaching for many years. So I had my subject matter pretty much uh, wrapped up. But what I was very ignorant about, very naive about, was methodology. Uh, I was also philosophically very naive. And um, I went to do my doctorate at Reading University in England, and that one of the reasons I went there was because um, I met Colin Trudgill at one point, who told me that Reading University was one of the few universities in England that would allow you to do a doctorate with only one year in residence. I could get leave of absence for one year, which I did, and I went there, and then having been one year in residence, I was then able to go back for the following two or three years, once or twice a year, see my supervisor and so on, and that's how it grew. Um, the first meeting I had with my head of department at Reading University was uh, the linguist uh, Frank Palmer, who was a very well-known linguist. He was in the Department of Linguistics. And um, I outlined my project to him, and he gave me a very small piece of paper, kind of half an, half an A4, um, on which he had uh, written his official supervisory advice. And I still have the bit of paper, and this is what it said. There are about uh, eight little points here. The first point was, be brief. A thesis of 60,000 words can be quite satisfactory. 100,000 words is usually too long. Do not deal at length with matters that are familiar. Keep the introductory sections short. Do not make extensive use of quotations. In particular, do not use quotations as authority for your views. Restrict references to those that are relevant. Restrict your discussion to the facts, i.e. do not include statements of an emotive kind, and be careful not to assume what you have to prove. If you have a great deal of research material, do not include it in the thesis, but make sure it is available for inspection. And finally, if your thesis is on an interdisciplinary subject, be very careful to check the appropriateness and correctness of your material, theory, etc., from the point of view of the other disciplines. And that was the end of my methodological training. Uh, I had done a master's before in another university where I had picked up a few bits and pieces, that's true. Um, so I was not entirely ignorant. Um, but this little bit of paper is what he gave to all his students, and he, had, he assumed that would be enough. It was good advice. But looking back now, I do think there was a gap. Um, I was largely unaware of philosophy of science at that time. And I was not very well informed about many things that I would now consider as absolutely fundamental for any doctoral researcher. Fortunately, however, I was saved by a little book which I came across as I was starting my, my doctoral studies called Popper by Brian McGee, or McGee. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce his name. Perhaps it's Brian McGee. Um, 
This book opened huge windows for me. It, it changed my life, I, I would say. And I quickly became completely hooked on Popper. I read a great deal about Popper and by Popper, and I deliberately structured my thesis along Popperian lines, which I stated very explicitly in the very first paragraph of the thesis. Um, showing how I started with a problem, an initial hypothesis, which I plan to knock down, the traditional analysis, and then I proposed my wonderful new analysis of my topic, which was something to do with the articles in English, um, and then somebody else could come along and knock me down in turn. So the whole thesis I organized on Popperian lines, and when I look back on that, I realized that that was very, very lucky to have discovered this way of thinking. This was my doorway into the philosophy of science. And it was a very good doorway. Of course, looking back again now, um, I became later much more critical of some of Popper's ideas, but he did remain an inspiration to me. For instance, in the way my ideas about ethics developed, in my understanding of the fundamental importance of criticism in any search for knowledge, how learning how to react to criticism without becoming insulted, not actually one of Popper's best virtues himself, if you read his life, he, he hated being criticised, which I thought was always a bit, a bit silly, and in my love of a good argument. So, with the wisdom of this hindsight, I wish I had known a great deal more about the philosophy of science much earlier in my academic life. I think this would have been of enormous significance to the quality of my research. Um, so, I prepared for this discussion here, I prepare a list of ten topics, and I'll go through these topics now briefly, and I submit that these ten topics should be part of a compulsory course in the philosophy of science for any doctoral student. I think these are absolutely basic, um, and I'm horrified at my own ignorance of these, many of these, at the time I was working myself. I also noticed from the discussions I've heard and listening to the discussions with the students over the last two or three days that some of these topics would be of extreme relevance to students who are right now in the middle of their doctoral uh, programs. I, I see great gaps in conceptual uh, awareness of some of these major problems. It seems to me that it would be very useful to have a course or read a basic book on the philosophy of science, even at the stage when you have just, you're just beginning to get an idea of what your doctoral topic might be. And uh, there are such books available, I can make a few suggestions, and there's loads of stuff available online, but you need to know what to look for. Okay, so I'm going to give a list of ten. I'll then throw the discussion open, you may want to add your own favourites, so we end up with eleven or twelve or seventeen. But this is my top ten. Number one, the history of science. I think it's very helpful to know the basic outline, something about the basic history of science. What did Aristotle think about causality? What really made Galileo revolutionary? Why is Darwin amazing? What did Kuhn add to our understanding of the historic of the history of science? And so on. I just these are just notes. Okay, that's topic one some basic understanding of the history of science. Number two, some understanding of what makes the difference between science and pseudo-science. What distinguishes scientific knowledge from other kinds of knowledge? Um, a few notes under this heading. Popper's argument about falsifiability. What does it mean to falsify something? Why was Popper wrong in assuming that total falsifiability was possible? What are the problems of the falsifiability position? Um, what does it mean to say that the claim must be testable? What are the criteria by which one can confirm a hypothesis or a claim? Testing, confirming, falsifying, the need for a critical attitude. 